In this video, we're gonna get started with landscape painting. Um, we're just gonna use black and white. We're gonna keep it simple. We only have one major concept to go over and that is overlapping. We're gonna explore some ways that that works and I'm gonna give you a bunch of little tips and details along the way. We're also gonna go over the concept of foreground, middle ground, background, and dark, medium, light and see how we can combine and vary those to create more and more interesting landscapes. I'm gonna hit you with the demo and it starts right now. While you're watching the first little tip that I have for you, I want you to go ahead and mix up three piles of paint. One, pretty much just straight black, one uh, straight white, and the other about a 50-50 mixture. You can go ahead and put matte medium, glazing liquid, or get ready to water them down. I'm also going to add some uh, slow drying agent as well. Just a quick refresher on overlap. Overlap is a very, very simple concept. And typically when you see overlap, you see this particular drawing. Overlap in many ways is the simplest and cheapest way to create depth. It immediately makes three rectangles look like one is behind the next without much effort. And that's our main concept in landscape painting. It's just that in painting, rather than in drawing, we're actually filling up these squares, right? So we take different values and we bucket fill each layer, right? Um, if I bucket fill that, that would be a disaster. So we'll bind that bucket fill, right? So we get overlaps that work more or less like that. Now we get fancy with it and we start doing things with our basic shapes. We have our triangle, rectangle, and circle, and we can overlap our basic shapes. Right? And we can do various combinations of all of these overlaps, and we can use them in different ways. We can think about simple shapes for trees, especially as we're planning layouts in our compositions, right? We can have trees that are more or less like that, like a pine tree. You can have sort of the oak tree shape. And so you can begin painting with very simple shapes and a very simple overlapping concept. Um, and that's kind of how you, how you can kind of get through this initial setup. And essentially what we're talking about with these basic shapes is we are doing organic versions of these basic shapes. So we're taking the triangle, right? And we're doing organic things with it. So we can round out triangles. We can take um, the circle or an oval and we can give it sort of flat sides and wonky edges and this can become something like a tree or a rock. We can take, you know, squares and we can make them organically modified to be um, rockier um, and create stacks and layers of rocks with cracks in them and so on. Right? You know, we can take um, triangles and make them organic and turn them into something like large cliff faces or hills, right? So we're using basic shapes modified organically. Now we're on to our actual painting. I like to start with the middle values usually because they're easy to see, especially if you haven't put a ground tone on your paper. And right here, you can see that I am starting with sort of the middle ground shape. And you don't necessarily have to start with the middle ground, foreground, or background. It doesn't really matter where you begin, just that you do begin. Um, one of the concepts that we will go over in more detail shortly is where to put the light, medium, and dark depending on what you want to do with the composition. Um, what's nice about paint 
And what's nice about acrylic especially is that it dries very quickly and it's opaque. So you can paint the background in first and then overlay the uh, middle ground and the foreground, which is very convenient because you can kind of paint through objects and then paint over objects. It can become complicated to paint front to back, but um, it can be done. So what we are doing is a kind of back to front layout and a back to front method, which is really convenient when you're thinking already in terms of foreground, middle ground, and background. So now I think we need to freeze the frame here and go into some more detail about how to lay out these foreground, middle ground, and background values. What you're looking at here are the six combinations of foreground, middle ground, and background, and dark, medium, and light. Without the simplified layer, um, I have these six sketches that I've done in ink and marker, and they're in a multiplied blend mode, so normally they would look like this, but so that you can kind of see some of the line work with the simplified values, um, I've changed the, the blend mode, just so that doesn't confuse you. Um, and the combinations are just uh, math, right? So if you take, you know, two sets of three things, they can only combine in six different ways. So these are all six different ways. Um, on the top left here, you have foreground, middle ground, and background uh, going in medium, dark, and light. And that creates a lighting situation where the foreground is basically in shadow and you have dark objects in the middle. Um, here, this is almost the opposite situation. You have a dark background and then you have a light foreground, uh, medium, middle ground. Over here, uh, in this composition, you have light, dark, and then medium going front to back. And then you can see how that plays out in the other compositions. Now, you'll notice that there are other values within each of these areas. So in this, in this particular instance, you have a foreground that is light, but you'll see medium and dark values in there as well. But the thing is, when you zoom out here, you will notice that overall it reads as light. And that's really what we care about. We care about the overall read of an area. So here, um, in this one, you'll see in the background there are some darker and lighter values surrounding the medium, but overall it reads as medium, right? In the foreground you have light and dark right next to each other, so, um, but still the foreground reads as mostly light. Um, same thing here in, in this one in the bottom right corner. This is interesting because the sky is light, but then the hill right next to it is dark. So I would call that a dark background, even though the sky is light, um, because you have a very clear uh, foreground, middle ground, and then background layer leading up to where you have the sky. So overall, that background is going to be dark. Um, it's a little bit funky. You might want to sneak some more darks into the foreground to kind of balance it out. But um, overall, that's what we're talking about. Over here, we have a dark foreground, medium middle ground, and light background, which is kind of a very natural way to compose um, a landscape. And here you have a cliff side on the left that's shadowing everything. And you get some clouds. And then you have a few middle and dark areas in the background, but not that much, um, so that the background reads light. We'll go back into the landscape. Now, what I'm about to do, uh, after I've got this basic shape laid in, is I'm going to just, without really differentiating any of the internal shapes, group these two trees that are sitting in the middle of this riverbed with the rest of the middle ground because they're not in the immediate foreground in like the first 20 feet of the composition, I'm going to assign them as just being part of the middle ground. And so because they're in the middle ground, I'm simplifying and I'm going to compress all of that value and all of that texture down into one big flat middle gray shape. And I suggest that that's the kind of thing that you think about when you're beginning the layout uh, of a painting 
And remember, this lesson is really about how to start a painting. It's not about how to finish a painting. It's how to think through some of these concepts and how to um, approach simplifying what you see so that you can actually paint it effectively. Now, there's some more information that we need to go over and um, something to watch out for when we're determining what these shapes are. So let's pause here and do a little aside. This one's very, very simple, and that's just to avoid parallel lines. So let's say that you are creating a stream and you want your stream to come down over the horizon, right? What we want to do is we want to avoid lines that directly parallel each other because that's kind of boring, right? So instead of that, we create a stream that expands, grows differently, and has non-parallel lines that help things become more interesting and more organic, right? So another thing that, let's say in our middle ground we have a bank of, of trees. If we take this bank of trees, run it across in a shape like that, and then run our bank of trees across and run directly like that, we've created basically a very static rectangle. It has some variation to it, but ultimately it's very boring. If we begin and we go through lines that aren't parallel and the trees come down like that, and then the trees go up like that, and begin and end at different spaces, if this is our format, right? That's a way more interesting way to lay out trees than the other way, right? If our format is like this, we're doing much better and, and creating much more interesting and dynamic shapes in the other method. So now that we know to watch out for parallel lines, we'll get back to the painting. So now I have a very, a very like sizable background shape. Uh, and what I need to do, rather than leaving it paper white, is I need to just fill it in. If I leave it paper white, it'll work um, as a background value, as a light value, but it it's just kind of um, bad practice, I guess. If you're going to layer over it later and take this to finish and and colorize it and everything like that, it helps just to have a little bit of paint on the on the paper or on the canvas um, because that also helps to, to prime it and do a bunch of other technical things that we don't need to get into. So here I'm actually going over the edge of what I've originally put down in the middle ground and I think that's important to point out because if you go right up to the edge and you do a very sharp edge that is fine and it can work but it's also going to make everything feel disunified and a little bit like paper cutouts and that's not something that you necessarily want to do when you're painting. Um, you can do that. Uh, people do that all the time. But it's something that can potentially kill your depth uh, depending on how you handle that. Painting eventually becomes about edge control and we're going to work a lot with edge control later. Now we're really getting into the depths of this particular piece. So we need to introduce uh, one quick tip on another basic compositional concept before we move on. I don't want you to do the stack. So imagine we're looking at the beach. If we, if we stand on the, on the beach and just look out at the ocean, we see the horizon line and we see the sky. Then below the sky, we see water. And then we see the water's edge and we see the sand. This composition has no sense of overlap at all, right? There's no depth in it in terms of overlapping. We can do things with value and with transitions to create overlapping through a stacked composition, as you'll see in the um, combinations of foreground, middle ground, background, and dark medium light sketches that I've done. Um, but it takes some trickery to get that to work. So if we avoid this composition, we've already done something to buy depth. And what do I mean by avoiding that composition? So let's say that you have a horizon line right at the 60-40 mark. 
And let's say we have some mountains that we want to draw. So if we put some mountains back here, right, we can begin to stack mountains such that they overlap each other and they overlap the horizon line. So the horizon line disappears. Then we come over here and we can stack even more mountains on top of each other. Put mountains in the background, put mountains in the foreground, and so on. And so already we're avoiding the stack because we have put some things in front of others, right? Then if we take clouds and we put clouds in the background, right? And these are overly idealized, silly, cartoony clouds, but clouds nonetheless, right? We're avoiding that stack again. Now, if we put, um, you know, a stream going through way back from the horizon, turns into a big river or something like that, that gives us more compositional shapes. But then if we put, um, say like, you know, bushes, rocks, or foliage over that area, um, we begin to break up that bit of the stack. Now if we put forests down here, right, we put trees here, we then break up the edge of the mountains, and the mountains get overlapped, and then we put more here, and more here, and then if we come into the foreground and we have some like cheesy foreground pine trees, this pine tree right here overlaps the mountain and everything. And then maybe we have like a very, you know, a very large pine tree right here, and that comes in and covers up a bunch of stuff. That maybe not is the that may not be like the best compositional decision, but it's a possibility. Um, so what we're looking for are things that go across the stacked layers and cross the horizon especially and cross each other in order to create more overlap. And when we do that, it gives us a more sophisticated composition and gets us out of this sky, water, sand stack that we're so used to seeing. Back to the painting. So we've learned what a stacked composition is and what it's looking like now is that we are using a stacked composition um, but fortunately, we still have a foreground left to paint, and that foreground is going to save us from the stack. So um, now we're still working in the middle ground, but I'm taking this light value and I'm um, laying that down onto the riverbed. I'm being fairly careful about where it goes uh, up to the rest of the middle ground layer, where it goes into the actual middle value gray. But on the bottom, I don't have to be particularly careful because I know that I'm going to paint over that edge. So I can take my mental capacity and, um, you know, relax it when I get down to the bottom because I know that all I have to do is just paint a little more than I think I should um, because I know I'm going to come back with a different value. Uh, here I'm actually kind of sketching out that pathway and I'm making sure that the pathway doesn't parallel itself, that it creates interesting shapes, that it kind of creates a nice little S-curve coming up and that I use a little bit of linear perspective so that the pathway expands as I come forward. So I'm kind of thinking about how these flat shapes can actually do uh, some stuff that I was kind of doing my drawing concepts. So now we're kind of done with the middle ground, we're done with the background, and we need to start blocking in the foreground and we're gonna take this dark uh, area and start to block it in. You'll notice that a lot of the foreground is definitely middle value, but who cares? We're just going to combine it all together and we're going to shovel it all into one value because we are trying to simplify. We're not trying to get complica complicated. We're not going for complexity. This is our first layer of paint. The first thing that we have to do when we do a painting is, you know, well, of course, pick what we're going to paint and all that. But when we sit down to paint, the first thing that we have to do, the bare minimum requirement, is just to cover the surface with paint. Essentially, that's what painting is. And um, once we do that, then a lot of the pressure's off. We've created a painting and we can back up 
We can take a look at what we just established and we can refine it. So here, what I need to do is approximate what's kind of going on with this foreground and create some interesting shapes. Now, because I'm working with one flat value, what's really happening is I'm working with shapes. And no matter what I do to this, I'm, I'm going back to that basic lesson in overlap and shape that I'm just working with shapes. That's all I can work with in paint. I can't really work with lines very well. It's just shapes. So some of these might seem like lines and I'm thinking in terms of line a little bit, but ultimately that line has thickness. That line becomes a shape as I group them all together. So I have to think about how these shapes are gonna intersect and overlap with the uh, middle ground and it, with the sky in the background here. So I'm just kind of squinting in my subject here and allowing the values to kind of compress together and become one unified dark area. Um, this is the tricky part about painting an up close foreground in landscape is that you want some of the background and some of the middle ground to show through. So you don't want the foreground to just block off the whole front of the canvas. So leaving these empty spaces, leaving the negative shapes are just as important as painting in this positive shape that we're, that we're working with. When we paint in this dark area, we're painting in a positive shape. When we leave areas blank, we're painting in a negative shape. We're not painting in that area. Now, one of the fun things that we can do with paint, because it is opaque, is we can go back and forth between the positive and the negative shapes, and we can take any of these three values and paint back and forth over each other to create the interesting shapes that we need to create. Now, there are some specifics that I would like to go over in terms of how to think about these very, very complicated areas. What you don't want to get stuck doing is painting every single leaf. That would be tedious and annoying and no fun at all. And I'm going to talk about that with a little aside here in just a moment, as soon as I'm done with this right half of this compositional area. Whenever you're painting something really complex, like a tree or some plants in the foreground, there is this temptation to get super fancy and um, try very hard to get all of this texture and all of these fussy little details and paint, um, you know, tons of little details into what's essentially just um, a very simple like area of grass, right? You don't want to sit there painting each individual blade of grass, right? Because that would get A, time consuming, and B, drive you completely insane. So what we do to kind of solve that is we group things, right? So if we see an area where we've got, say, a bush, and the bush does something like that. And it's got a bunch of leaves there and it's catching some light here and there, right? We can have a three layer stack, stacked uh, shrubbery. You know, in our first stages of painting, we don't want to be that complex. We can get there eventually, but in our first stages, we probably just want to group it all together and make it one value. So if it's in the shade and it's dark, and overall, if you squint at it, if it's dark, you just go through there and make it all dark. Quite a simple thing. So grouping is this main concept. If you see a tree, and this tree has tons of dead little branches, I think this is one of the toughest things to encounter in the landscape is a, is a dead tree in the foreground. We have just tons and tons of little branches. You have to figure out how to group them because you, you know, paint's thick, it's muddy, it's goo, and you have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. So there may be ways that you can just very softly 
instead of drawing each individual branch, come up there and very quickly in one or two strokes indicate a grouping of these leaves without really doing tons of work. Maybe you do, on occasion, paint one little fly out, or maybe you're able to group a huge area of the tree, right, and have a few fly out branches that you paint individually. So this will save you some time and some energy and make things easier to read just by grouping. Okay, now we're in the finishing stages of the initial part of this painting. Um, we're gonna work now with our knowledge of grouping and finish out this foreground and then maybe do a little bit of refinement if we can uh, to finish out this painting. Um, but what I want you to focus on for this particular segment of landscape or I've hit you with several concepts that are going on um, because no one concept works in complete isolation. But I want you to focus on just one thing at a time. If you can get a handle, if you've already got a handle of overlapping and how overlapping works, that's great. You know, add in this grouping concept. Um, think about your compositions, your, your using areas where there aren't parallel lines. Begin to consider uh, how, you're, how you handle edges, which we'll get into uh, in greater depth later. Um, so here what I'm actually kind of doing is, is thinking about those edges and thinking about the, the shapes that I want to create and what these brush marks kind of look like. Um, if I need to add some stuff, I can add some stuff. Like there wasn't really a, a trunk or many branches that are really visible holding up this left side of the tree. So I didn't want to just like throw on some branches from off the edge of the format. So, or throw on some leaves from the edge of the format. So I added a, a little bit of a trunk, some branches to kind of make this make a little more sense. And then I want to also just be sure that I watch out for any tangents that I might create in the composition um, because those are always kind of problematic. And I want to be sure that I leave some room so that you can see some of the real ground. You know, this isn't a perfect exact copy of this photograph. Um, it's more about the using the photograph as a reference to kind of get this idea across and to think about how I want to estimate and represent little things that I see about this landscape and to create this feel that you're walking down a path and then all of a sudden you turn and you see this you know, beautiful orange tree out in the middle of this dried riverbed. Um, and sticking exactly to the photograph is never really going to get this exact feel that you want to create. We look for ways to help emphasize the things that we want to draw out of that landscape and out of that experience of, of taking the reference. And, you know, of course, in a in a class, I'll give you a bunch of references, but if you have your own, you should use those. Um, anytime that you take a reference yourself, I think is a, is a good thing. You should always kind of have a camera with you wherever you travel and, or just going around town, because when you see something, it could, it could turn into a painting, and it's just nice, additionally, to have a reference library from, with images that you can work with so that um, you're never at a loss of what to paint or having to spend time, you know, using Google searches to find these references. Now, one of the things that I noticed here in this little middle ground area is that I needed to kind of play with where the trunks are and how they kind of overlap and how they align with each other. Um, you'll notice that they aligned in almost a perfectly parallel line, uh, parallel to the horizon line and to the format of the page. So I kind of had to break those up a little bit and tweak those so that they could um, interact a little bit better. One of the things that's happening off screen is that I'm um, oftentimes um, wiping down the brush to get some of the wet paint off of it. It makes it easier to, uh, to handle everything. The other thing that I notice is that the pathway, when it goes under the tree canopy, gets a little darker. So 
to fully complete my dark foreground, I'm going to take that light pathway that I had and I am going to run this middle gray over the whole pathway so that it um, kind of conceptually makes a little bit more sense. Um, sometimes you run into these situations where you need to refine what you've done. And in a lot of ways, um, a painting is very flexible. You can change it at any point during its, its construction and during the process of painting. You can go backwards and you can go uh, ahead. You can, you know, paint up uh, a huge area and then paint over it again. And you can do a lot to help things make more sense in this, um, in this sort of way. I'm actually doing a little bit of a uh, fade and transition here. Um, that's something we'll get into heavily later. Uh, um, you know, these, this idea of like blending values or, or transitioning them or modeling them. Right now we're kind of focusing on, on graphic shapes, um, which is sort of flat, more hard edged, or you know, even soft edges sometimes, but thinking in terms of these, these big shapes with well-defined edges. Um, you know, even if the, we're painting loosely like this and the, and the edge gets a little brushy, that's okay. We're still thinking in terms of largely like flat areas. So sometimes you might need to go back into your painting and touch up some of the edges, you know, make sure that you're really covering the canvas well and that these, um, these areas are getting cleaned up. So that's it for this particular demo. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you um, have success working on your first few landscape layout block-in paintings because they can be really quite enjoyable to do.